Theistic Evolution Critique, How to Lose a Battleship. We've been discussing the book Theistic Evolution, um, a scientific, philosophical, and theological critique. And uh, we are into the second section. Before we begin, I should remind us again that uh, there are several ways to look at uh, the creation evolution controversy. Uh, one can go with young life creationism. One can go with what's traditionally called old earth, but should be probably renamed old life creationism. One can go with a theistic evolution that is intelligent design friendly, that is to say, things happen slowly, but God was involved in the process, and you can show it. And, and uh, there is also theistic evolution that uh, alleges things happen the way atheists would say, but you can't tell that God was involved. Or maybe I should say, and you can't tell. And then finally, there's atheistic evolution itself. Those are kind of the alternatives that are being looked at. And the book takes no official position between the first three. And it's not really aimed at atheistic evolution, but it is primarily aimed at non-ID theistic evolution. Our chapter today is written by Stephen Dilley, and it's in section two, which is the philosophical critique. We've been through the scientific critique, the theological critique is still on its way. And this is entitled, How to Lose a Battleship, Why Methodological Naturalism Sinks Theistic Evolution. The summary, which is sort of an abstract, it says, theistic evolutionists should reject methodological naturalism. Among other reasons, methodological naturalism prohibits both the use of theology-laden claims within scientific discourse and scientific engagement with so-called non-scientific theories like creationism and intelligent design. Uh, notice the distinction between those two. And yet, key scientific arguments for evolutionary theory from the origin to the present either rely on theology-laden claims or engage the creationist or intelligent design theories in a scientific manner. Under methodological naturalism, however, this dynamic is not acceptable. Accordingly, if theistic evolutionists accept methodological naturalism, they forfeit significant justification for their favorite theory, fa favored theory. Insofar as theistic evolutionists wish to retain this justification, they ought to set methodological naturalism aside. And uh, the uh, chapter begins, the year 1866 was conspicuous for Charles Darwin. Scientific consensus was at last leaning toward common ancestry and away from special creation. Darwin keenly monitored this development in the fourth edition of The Origin, published that year, he inserted a new claim, namely, that special creation's account of homology was not a scientific explanation. Yet through all six editions, Darwin also continued to give scientific arguments as to why evolutionary theory was empirically superior to special creation. Moreover, Darwin also employed an array of partisan theological claims as part of his positive argument for evolutionary theory. In effect, he adopted a dual strategy, assail special creationism using scientific arguments and, when useful, declare that special creationism is not scientific. Darwin's dual strategy was intellectually incoherent. Two mutually exclusive options were on the table and Darwin took both which is an interesting comment, and think about that as we keep going. A similar dilemma persists to this present day. As we will see, contemporary theistic evolutionists cannot coherently accept scientific arguments that support evolutionary theory over creationism and also accept methodological naturalism, which bars creationism from scientific analysis. My core thesis in this chapter is that theistic evolutionists should reject methodological naturalism. Doing so allows them to retain a central justification for evolutionary theory, the apparently overwhelming evidence 
that supports it over all rivals. My argument falls into four parts. In part one, I set the stage by defining relevant terms, noting clarifications and the like. In part two, I move to the body of my argument, contending that theistic evolutionists must choose one of the two mutually exclusive routes outlined above. In part three, I argue against methodological naturalism by exploring several ways in which method evolutionary thinking involves theology. As we will see, for example, many evolutionary biologists routinely cre treat creationism as a scientifically testable theory, marshalling empirical evidence to refute it. More strikingly, a wide range of scientific arguments for evolutionary theory actually depend on theological claims. Collectively, these ways of supporting evolutionary theory involve God talk and thus run contrary to methodological naturalism. In part four, I turn to the other strategy available to theistic evolutionists, accept methodological naturalism and treat creationism as outside of science. I argue that this approach fails. The reasons for methodological naturalism are weak, while reasons against it are strong. Among other things, I contend that acceptance of methodological naturalism greatly harms the case for evolutionary theory rendering scientific evidence impotent to support evolutionary theory over creationism. All told, if theistic evolutionists wish to maintain, re retain maximum support for evolution, if they wish to keep their battleship, they ought to discard methodological naturalism. Part one, setting the stage. Definitions. Methodological naturalism is only permissible explanations within scientific research, articulation, and argument are those that appeal to natural entities, causes, processes, laws, and the like. In short, natural explanations rather than theological ones belong in science. Or maybe one should say to the exclusion of theological ones. According to methodological naturalists, the convention is not an arbitrary rule imposed upon science, but a thoughtful conclusion based on reflection about the nature, context, and purposes of science. Christian methodological naturalists typically regard natural causes and laws as secondary causes and laws, that is, God's ordinary way of ruling the universe. The prohibition of God talk within science is in no way suggests that theology and science have nothing vital to say to each other in conversation. Methodological naturalism runs contrary to the incursion of theological explanations within scientific research and discourse. At a deeper level, methodological naturalism also prohibits any substantive theological propositions within science. As theistic evolutionist Dennis Alexander, Holmes Ralston III, and Jeffrey Schloss wrote, the very purpose of science is to explain the workings of nature without recourse to religious language. Or as Michael Ruse, uh, who's an atheist, observed, the methodological naturalist insists that inasmuch as one is doing science, one avoids all theological or other religious references. Having clarified the heart of methodological naturalism, I note that the convention comes in two flavors, intrinsic and pragmatic. The former treats methodological naturalism as an inviolable rule of, that governs science. Theological claims are never allowed within scientific discourse or research, even in principle. The latter is more modest. On this view, the default practice of scientists within the context of their field should be to explain natural phenomena by reference only to natural or secondary causes, laws, and the like. In this chapter, I use methodological naturalism to refer to the intrinsic version. That's the first one. What is theistic evolution? Most versions have in common the claim that God's design of biological phenomena or history is not empirically detectable using the rigorous methods of science. God signs his handiwork using invisible ink, as they say. By evolutionary theory, or just plain evolution, I mean standard neo-Darwinism. I use the term theological theory in a stipulated way. I mean a claim or set of claims about a supernatural agent's action vis-a-vis -vis, um, biological phenomena or history in a manner that purports to be scientifically confirmable or falsifiable in principle. Because this is precisely the type of theory that methodological naturalism rejects within science, it is directly relevant to assessing the viability of methodological naturalism. 
or stylistic variety, I will sometimes use instead the term supernatural theories or God hypothesis, presumably instead of theological theory, meaning the same thing. By creationism, I mean a theological theory in which the deity in question is the God of the Bible who is said to have created in a manner that accords with a more or less literal reading of Genesis 1. Finally, just to be clear, by theology I mean propositions about any supernatural being, or for that matter, hypothetical supernatural being. Clarifications. Several key items remain to be clarified. First, the crucial difference between theological theories and theistic evolution, as I've characterized them, turn on, turns on whether there is scientific evidence of God's design in biological phenomena or history. The former affirms this, while the latter denies it. The difference between the two is not about the following. Whether God ontologically sustains creation, you can find people on both sides arguing both ways. Whether God created a given biological phenomenon by a direct miracle or alternatively indirectly through secondary or natural means. Again, one can find arguments from both sides on both ends of that. Whether common ancestry is true. At what time in history God designed organisms or their features. For present purposes, it matters little whether God acted during biological history or instead front-end loaded the cosmos at its initial creation so that it expressed marks of design later in biological history. It may matter for other people uh, or for other purposes, but it does not matter for talking about methodological naturalism. Whether God designed anything at all in organic history, or if he did, how many things? None of these points mark the salient difference between theistic evolution and theological theories. Instead, what separates them is epistemological. Whether there is empirically detectable scientific evidence of God's design in biological phenomena or history. Crucially, the line that separates theistic evolution from theological theories does not hinge on the acceptance or rejection of methodological naturalism. Both approaches are compatible with either this convention or its denial. In particular, theistic evolutions are free to discard methodological naturalism. That is, they can allow religious language, including theological theories, into science proper, while also accepting that evolutionary theory provides a true physical explanation of organic history. They would accept that they're legitimate, they're just wrong. In this approach, theological theories are regarded as false, but not necessarily as unscientific. A false theory may still be a scientific one. In fact, the history of science is littered with such theories. The rejection of methodological naturalism simply means that God talk is permissible within scientific research and discourse. It does not imply that any judge does not imply any judgment regarding the truth or falsity of this God talk. Methodological naturalism itself concerns what counts as scientific, not what counts as correct per se. As such, theistic evolution is fully compatible with the rejection of this convention. Uh, a third clarification focuses on intelligent design theory. Is it a theological theory? Opinions vary. For now, I grant that IG, ID is a theological theory. I might add in opposition or in contrast to the uh, uh, standard argument that ID is not necessarily theological. Given that, and the reason why is given that many theistic evolutions regard it as such. That is to say, he's granting the premise of theistic evolutionists. But my argument does not hinge upon the matter one way or the other. I should note in passing that if ID is not a theological theory, then methodological naturalism, which prohibits theology, poses no barrier to regarding ID as fully scientific, as interestingly um, evidenced by Richard Dawkins, who accepted intelligent design as long as it wasn't God. Fourth, I want to be clear that this chapter does not dispute the truth of evolutionary theory or of theistic evolution. The truth or falsity of these positions is the subject of other chapters in this volume. Instead, my concern is simply whether theistic evolutionists ought to embrace methodological naturalism. 
Finally, although I suspect that most theistic evolutionists hold to or apply, hold or apply methodological naturalism in an inconsistent way, and we'll come back to that, my purpose here is not to argue for this claim. Instead, my central thesis is that, regardless of any alleged inconsistency, theistic evolutionists ought to reject methodological naturalism. Theistic evolution and methodological naturalism. Compatible companions? As it happens, the overwhelming majority of theistic evolutionists accept methodological naturalism in one form or another. Although some thinkers are not totally clear, the list of those who accept it apparently includes, and there's a long list if you're interested, you can look at the book. And uh, the next chapter mentions Biologus, who has an official position of that kind. Mutually exclusive routes. <clears throat> Having set out the initial groundwork, I now turn to the body of the chapter. Theistic evolutionists have two primary routes by which to support evolutionary theory and counter rival theological theories. Remember, they are doing theology as well as evolution. These routes are mutually exclusive. Choosing one means foregoing the other. The first route is to adopt methodological naturalism. On this path, Theistic evolutionists can claim that there are good grounds to exclude God hypothesis, hypotheses from biology. These grounds are generally theological, historical, conceptual, empirical, or pragmatic. Yet because methodological naturalism bars supernatural theories from science proper, it follows that methodological naturalism also prohibits scientific analysis of such theories. I will examine this methodological naturalism only route for theistic evolution theistic evolutionist in part four. By contrast, an alternative route rejects methodological naturalism. In this approach, theistic evolutionists can bolster evolutionary theory and critique supernatural rivals by placing them in head-to-head -head competition within science. On this basis, the theistic evolutionists can argue that evolutionary theory is empirically superior to its theological counterparts. I will examine this route in part three. As noted, the two routes described here are mutually exclusive. If theistic evolutionists adopt methodological naturalism, which prohibits theology within biology, then they cannot make a scientific argument against God hypotheses, nor can they utilize theology in their positive scientific case for evolution. If you pays your money, as the old saw goes, you takes your choice. Skipping over a paragraph, a critic might, dis might disagree with this way of carving up the territory. You might contend that even while holding methodological naturalism, theistic evolutionists can still make extensive empirical evaluation of God hypotheses, yet do so under the rubric of a non-scientific discipline such as natural theology or something similar. Alternatively, a critic might contend that theology-based views can be scientifically evaluated without any God talk and so without violating methodological naturalism. Suppose, for example, a paleontologist wished to evaluate the scientific credentials of young earth creationism. Suppose, further, that young earth creationism predicts that humans and dinosaurs lived during overlapping geological eras. Can't a paleontologist scientifically assess this claim without using any theological statements? After all, he would mainly analyze fossils and wouldn't rely on propositions about God per se. Accordingly, since theology is not present, no violation of methodological naturalism occurs. In response to this last objection, the matter is surely complex. In a sense, much of my chapter functions as a reply to this objection. For now I note that theology is actually quite relevant to the young earth case, as it is to other cases discussed in this chapter. The proximate claim under assessment is that humans and dinosaurs lived during overlapping geological eras. While assessing this claim in isolation requires no theological language, the claim in context is part of a broader conditional. If young earth creationism is true, then humans and dinosaurs lived during overlapping geological eras. The very reason to analyze the consequent in the first place arises from the crucial presence of the, an presence of the antecedent. And the antecedent is simply shorthand for a set of specific claims about the God of the Bible. Moreover, if the consequent turns out to be false, then in the light of the conditional about young earth creationism, modus tollens mandates that young earth creationism is likewise false. Thus, in this context, the empirical observations and logical implications inevitably touch theology. 
God talk is clearly present in direct violation of methodological naturalism. I turn now to the first criticism, which held that God hypotheses can undergo extensive empirical evaluation under non-scientific headings such as natural theology. This possibility amounts to little more than a superficial relabeling. As a de facto matter, this evaluation is scientific. Part three, God talk and evolutionary reasoning, theology alive and well. Evolutionists have a long history both engaging God hypotheses on scientific grounds and using theology in the scientific case for evolutionary theory. Darwin's theory, after all, originally arose in response to a theological counterpart. As historian Abigail Lustig observes, modern evolutionary biology traces its descent, with modifications, <coughs> from Charles Darwin, and most particularly from the Origin of Species of 1859. The origin was itself created as a response to one of the greatest conundrums of natural history, the order and diversity of life, and to one of its most convincing answers, the theological argument from design. Evolutionary theory was in short born in theology. As other scholars have observed, in the origin Darwin borrowed from natural theology similar research problems, presuppositions, patterns of argumentation, metaphors, concepts, and content. More poignantly, Darwin plainly stated in the introduction to the origin that one of his chief goals was to argue that special creation is erroneous. But Darwin didn't simply critique a theological counterpart in the origin. He actually deployed theologically, theology laden claims as part of his extended argument. These theological claims were not merely rhetorical flourishes designed to persuade a Victorian audience, they were crucial elements of several of his epistemic arguments for evolution. These theology claim, laden claims include human beings are not justified in believing that God creates in ways analogous to the intellectual powers of the human mind. A God who is free to create as he wishes would create new biological limbs de novo rather than from a common pattern. Um, like uh, we know how God does it. A respectable deity would create biological structures in accord with a human conception of the simplest mode to accomplish the functions of these structures. Again, uh, we do know how God does it. God would create only the minimum structure required for a given part's function. God does not provide false empirical information about the origins of organisms. God impressed the laws of nature on matter. God directly created the first primordial life, which is interesting because that's one that is disputed by evolutionists today. God did not perform miracles within organic history subsequent to the creation of the first life. How do you know that God didn't do it? A distant God is not morally culpable for natural pain and suffering. The God of special creation who allegedly performed miracles in organic history is not plausible given the pain of natural pain, presence of natural pain and suffering. And skipping over a couple of things, the contest between natural and supernatural explanations of the physical world has been intertwined with the Western tradition from its inception. And they go on to quote you know, people like Aristotle. This pattern extends into the 21st century. Many contemporary biologists, both theistic evolutionists and others, rely on claims about God's nature and ways in their scientific case for evolution. And going through that list is kind of interesting because Francis Collins, Kenneth Miller, Dennis and Alexander, uh, Carl Giberson are all definitely creationists. Ian Bar Barber is probably t uh, or theistic evolutionist, I should say. And then some of the other people are uh, rather definitely... Uh, Atheists, including Jerry Coyne, Richard Dawkins, and Stephen Jay Gould. Theology-laden arguments appear in major areas of biology, including genetics, embryology, biogeography, paleontology, physiology, organic diversity, genomics, and the like. Careful analysis shows that these theological claims are typically indispensable to the argument in which they appear. Without God talk, the arguments do not support evolutionary theory. Just to be clear, my, aim is, my claim is not that evolutionary theory itself contains theological propositions. 
Instead, my claim is that self-reported scientific justifications for this theory often include theological claims. Moreover, my claim is not that every biologist who utilizes theology in his case for evolution is a religious believer. In fact, some atheists and agnostics have the strongest opinions about what God would have done in organic history were he to exist. And while some of these theological claims are entailed by creationism, a number of them are foreign to creationism and ID. That is, evolutionists often import their own partisan theology into their scientific case for evolution and against creationism or ID. They bring their own God talk to the table. To paraphrase a familiar saying, theistic evolutionists cannot serve both God and methodological naturalism. They must choose between a full-blooded scientific case for evolution on the one hand or the naturalistic method on the other. Two examples of theologically, theological involvement in evolutionary reasoning. And uh, the example one is God in the eye, which most of us are familiar with. In his best-selling uh, The Language of God, Collins, that's Francis Collins, of course, contends that the imperfections of the vertebrate eye confirm evolutionary accounts but pose a grave problem for intelligent design. He notes that while Darwin recognized the challenge of the, uh, the eye presented to his theory, nonetheless, Darwin proposed 150 years ago a series of steps in the evolution of this complex organ, which modern bio molecular biology is rapidly confirming. That's according to Collins anyway. By contrast, the design of the eye does not appear on close inspection to be completely ideal. The rods and cones that sense light are the bottom layers of the retina, and light has to pass through the nerves and blood vessels to reach them. Similar imperfections of the human body defy the existence of truly intelligent planning of the human form. Now, as Collins makes clear here and elsewhere in his book, imperfections are expected given, a, given evolution, but unexpected given intelligent design. Whereas evolution is a tinkering process that often produces suboptimal organisms, matters are different for an intelligent designer. Collins believes ID advocates have in mind a benevolent God who creates by direct supernatural fiat. Such a being would create a perfect eye, Collins thinks. In fact, Collins' line of reasoning implies that if scientists discover that the eye is suboptimal for vision in the present, then they can rightly conclude that God did not miraculously create the eye in the past. That is, God would ensure the optimality of the eye in, or to, the present day. So if we discover a suboptimal eye, this fact favors evolution over direct divine design. More precisely, if evolution had produced the eye in the past, it would not necessarily be completely ideal for vision in the present. That's premise one. Premise two, if God had created the eye by direct miracle in the past, he would have ensured that it is completely ideal for vision in the present. Three, the vertebrate eye does not appear to be completely ideal for vision in the present. And the conclusion, if the evidence is predicted by one hypothesis but contrary to prediction of another, then the evidence supports the former hypothesis over the latter, and therefore that a less, completely, less than completely ideal vertebrate eye supports evolutionary hypothesis over the divine miracle hypothesis. That's the logic. A few observations about the argument are, as a whole are in order. First, it's a scientific argument. Collins includes it under the heading Scientific Objections to ID. More importantly, the evidence cited in the argument arises from a scientific analysis of the structure and function of the rods, cones, and retina of the eye. Second, this polemic is a positive argument for evolution, not just a critique of ID or creationism. Despite Collins' heading, which treats the matter as merely an objection to ID, it is clear from the internal logic of the argument itself that the whole point is to show that the vertebrate eye counts as evidence for evolution over intelligent design. I now shift to a few observations about the individual premises of the argument. First, it's worth noting that recent research raises serious questions about premise three, which, is, which claims that the eye is suboptimal. Collins' key empirical claim may be flawed. 
we've been over some of this evidence in glass here before. In any case, the theological claim in premise two is of primary interest. In it, Collins says that if God had created the eye by direct miracle in the past, he would have ensured that it is completely ideal for vision in the present. The claim is indispensable for Collins' argument. If premise two is removed, then the argument is no longer logically valid and the conclusion literally does not flow from the premises. First, Collins provides no justification for his theological premise. He asserts it without any argument or citation from the biblical Bible, creeds, theological texts, or non-religious sources. This is especially troubling given that, as noted above, premise two is a subjunctive claim. It asserts what God would have done in the past. Second, Collins does not borrow premise two from his rivals. Neither ID nor creationism entail or makes probable this theological claim. Instead, Collins inserts his own sectarian theology into the discussion. Third, Collins' partisan claim ignores relevant biblical doctrines like the fall, in which, according to some scholars, the created order itself experiences decay and disorder. On this interpretation, a degree of suboptimality in creation is actually expected. A wide variety of theology-laden arguments for evolutionary theory share similar features, yet such discourse clearly violates methodological naturalism. Example two, God and flagella. Theistic evolutionists, um, referring to them, is, he says, all they, need is to, all they need to do is use theology-free statements to attack God hypotheses and to bolster evolutionary theory. But this objection, even correct, even if correct, is irrelevant. Methodological naturalism prohibits any assessment of theological theories within science, even when this assessment uses only theology-free statements. Using the famed bacterial flagellum as an example, Behe's argument can be represented as follows. Intelligent agency rather than unguided natural processes is the best explanation of irreducibly complex biological entities. The bacterial flagellum is an irreducibly complex biological entity. Thus, intelligent agency rather than unguided natural processes is the best explanation of the bacterial flagellum. Miller attacks both premises. Consider premise two first, which holds that the bacterial flagellum is irreducibly complex. Miller says this claim can be put to the test in a very direct way. If we are able to con find contained within the flagellum an example of a machine with fewer protein parts that serves a purpose distinct from motility, the claim of irreducible complexity is refuted. The flagellum does indeed contain such a machine, a protein secreting apparatus that carries out an important function even in species that lack the flagellum altogether. In other words, Miller argues something like this. If the bacterium flagellum is an irreducibly complex biological entity, then we should not find that the bacterial flagellum contains a machine with fewer protein parts than the flagellum and which serves a purpose distinct from motility. But we do find that the bacterial flagellum contains a machine with fewer protein parts than the flagellum which, and which serves a purpose distinct from motility. Thus, the bacterial flagellum is not an irreducibly complex biological entity. Pretty clearly, Miller's argument presupposes the empirical testability of Behe's intelligent design hypotheses. Notice that in attacking premise two, Miller uses only non-theological statements about protein parts, the type three system, etc. But he appropriates these statements to attack Behe's ID perspective. Miller clearly engages ID using scientific data and analysis. Unsurprisingly, Miller characterizes ID as a scientific position. But if it's a scientific position, then you can't exclude it from science, at least not implicitly. Of course, whether or not Miller's critique is successful is a matter for another time. For now, the key point is that Miller clearly provides a scientific evaluation of ID in direct contrast to methodological naturalism, which prohibits the consideration of God hypotheses in scientific contexts. Skipping on uh, for more of the same, part four, methodological naturalism only strategy. Um, 
Argument one, the irrelevance of scientific evidence. Liabilities abound with the methodological naturalism only tactic. First, by excluding adopting methodological naturalism, theistic evolutionists are left with arguments that attempt to cast God hypothesis as unscientific or as otherwise unacceptable. Such arguments are familiar. Creationism and ID are God of the gaps explanations. They also demean God's ontological preeminence, lessen his explanatory uniqueness, misconstrue the doctrine of creation, fail to be empirically testable, and so on. While I will address some of these arguments shortly, it is important to note that they have already been under intense fire for quite some time. Second, adhering to methodological naturalism yields no epistemic gains for theistic evolution. That is, borrowing creationism and ID from science does nothing in itself to make theistic evolution more pl plausible. Theistic evolution simply accepts a biological theory that bears the title scientific, whereas its supernatural rivals are non-scientific. But a scientific designation does not itself make a claim or set of just claims more likely to be true or justified than non-scientific claims. For example, some moral claims, such as the Golden Rule, are not scientific. And yet their designation as outside of science does not mean that they are any less likely to be true or justified. Likewise, some other views, such as the caloric th theory of heat, and there's bunches of those, including the theory of gravity of Newton, believe it or not, um, are rightly regarded as scientific, uh, yet are also clearly false. In fact, history is littered with thousands of false scientific claims. The mere label scientific does not itself make a claim true or false, well justified or poorly justified. Third, and more important, with methodological naturalism in play, theistic evolutionists cannot draw upon scientific evidence to critique any God hypothesis. Evidence is off limits from paleontology, molecular homology, uh, comparative anatomy, embryology, genomics, biogeography, and all the rest. For example, empirical data about radiometric dating would be off limits. Fourth, with mythological naturalism in play, scientific evidence is impotent to support evolutionary theory over its supernatural rivals. Finally, by adhering to methodological naturalism, theistic evolutionists arguably have to surrender their most important grounds for evolutionary theory itself. As I have noted, the history of evolutionary theory, past and present, is rife with contrastive arguments against ID or creationism in one form or another. Put simply, theistic evolutionists who adhere to methodological naturalism do so at great empirical cost to the justification of their own theory. Surely this ought to give them pause. A navy that has lost its mightiest battleship cannot easily declare victory. Argument two, critique of reasons for methodological naturalism. Broadly speaking, they fall into five categories, conceptual, theological, pragmatic, historical, and empirical. The final two typically dovetail together, so I will refer to both under the empirical rubric. I'm sorry. Pragmatic naturalism is discussed. Uh, by way of brief assessment, this version, pragmatic naturalism, is not a meaningful type of methodological naturalism. If biologists are open to God hypotheses in principle, then the only way they can know whether, say, a new God hypothesis has scientific merit is to analyze it. So the working version of methodological naturalism really isn't methodological naturalism at all, and I would agree with that wholeheartedly. This opens the door for scientists who accept supernatural th theories or who are against them to examine, develop, apply, and test, vindicate, or falsify these theories. M critics of methodological naturalism, and for that matter, creationists most of the time, will hardly protest. Uh, conceptual justifications of methodological naturalism. Having cleared the ground, I now turn to conceptual justifications for intrinsic methodological naturalism. This justification typically secures methodological naturalism by analyzing the conceptual properties of supernatural hypotheses and contending that such hypotheses lack at least one necessary feature of scientific hypotheses. 
Elliot Sober has articulated a nuanced objection to creationism and ID that can be parlayed into a conceptual justification of methodological naturalism. The basic idea is that the most promising way to formulate the design argument is as a likelihood argument, according to which, in this case, the empirical data is said to favor the design hypothesis over the evolutionary hypothesis. But to make this argument, Sober points out that one must know how likely it is that an intelligent designer would create the phenomenon in question. This requires knowledge of the designer's powers and plans. For example, in order to say that it is more likely that a designer would create, say, the vertebrate eye than would some evolutionary process, we ha must have some grounds for saying that a designer can make the eye and wants to do so. In particular, we must be able to say that it's more likely that a designer would make the eye than it is that evolutionary processes would do so. But aside from self-serving prior beliefs about a designer, Sober thinks we don't have any independent basis for the required claims about a designer's plans or powers. Put bluntly, we have no idea what a designer would do. Although that's an interesting critique um, of, of conservative Christianity. This lack of knowledge means that we cannot predict a designer's actions. Without the ability to generate a prediction, we cannot evaluate a design hypothesis against an evolutionary hypothesis. This means we cannot say that the empirical data favor design over evolution. In effect, we cannot empirically test the design hypothesis when formulated as a likelihood argument. Unfortunately, God hypotheses, as I use the term, do purport to be scientifically testable. Given that they are intended to be testable, yet cannot actually be tested, they arguably fail to qualify as scientific. Thus, the best type of design argument falls outside the pale, at least if you accept that argument. There's a lot to be said for this justification for methodological naturalism. It ranks as perhaps the best conceptual apologetic for the convention. Yet it falls prey to a fatal counterexample. Consider the logical, although outlandish, possibility that biologists discover an ancient line of cells with an inscribed message, perhaps in DNA. Um, Elliot Sober's view of the design argument is suspect. Moreover, the Los Angeles Ram will win, uh, Rams will win the 2030 Super Bowl. And yes, John 3.16 is true. Keep in mind this was written before this last Super Bowl. <clears throat> Suppose it comes to pass that against all odds, the Rams not only win a regular season game, but actually make the playoffs and triumph in the 2030 Super Bowl. Wouldn't biologists be scientifically justified to at least consider divine design as a possible explanation? And he comments that this is kind of whimsical and unlikely, but, it, but from a philosophical point of view, it's a possibility you have to consider. It would be absurd to obtain methodological naturalism in the face of this message. Surely the message should compel us at least to put design on the table as a scientific possibility. But methodological naturalism excludes even this modest consideration. The convention implies that no possible empirical data can ever provide good grounds to consider design hypothesis within science. Such a view is a tad extreme. Theological justifications of methodological naturalism. Uh, for example, Dennis Alexander, Robert Bishop, and of course there are others. These and other thinkers hold that methodological naturalism suitably maintains the creature, creator-creature distinction, affirms God's gift of cre creational freedom, preserves scripture's emphasis on God's normal mediated way of relating to creation and the like. Uh, a critic, C. John Collins, contends that the Bible regards God's extraordinary actions as sometimes resulting in empirically detectable states of affairs. God's special actions can leave traces. For examples include creation ex nihilo, the virgin conception of Jesus, transformation of water into wine, raising of Lazarus and others, the resurrection of Jesus, conversion of sinners, and so on. If the good Lord chose to sign his handiwork, Christians need not demur. Skipping on. Pragmatic justifications of methodological naturalism. Perhaps more promise lies with a pragmatic justification for methodological naturalism. At a practical level, God hypotheses are said to inhibit scientific process, progress, whereas naturalistic hypotheses enable the progress of science in both the past and the present. Um, 
at this point, junk DNA comes to my mind. In my view, Del Ratch has already successfully critiqued this view. In particular, a reasonable argument can be made that at times, naturalistic approaches have inhibited research, whereas some theological approaches have been quite fruitful. On the other hand, if progress is construed in a realist fashion, um, this is, that other was anti-realist, um, so that progress is measured in terms of the qualitative and or quantitative increase in naturalistic hypotheses that are true, then the objection is a version of the empirical and historical justification for methodological naturalism, which I address next. Empirical and historical justification. On this view, the pattern of scientific discovery over hundreds of years is marked by the growing explanatory power of naturalistic or secondary theories and also the diminished explanatory power of their testable theistic rivals. On realist grounds, this pattern suggests that as a category, natural hi naturalistic hypotheses are true, approximately true, or at least significantly more likely to be true than their supernatural com counterparts. <coughs> Accordingly, there is epistemic reason to block the incursion of hypotheses into science that have a track record of being empirically substandard. I've addressed this view in detail elsewhere. Here, I'll just mention a few points. First, this justification for methodological naturalism implies that what separates science from non-science is truth, approximate truth, or the property of being more likely to be true than a rival. But demarcation along these lines is tenuous. Surely truth or its cousins is not a necessary condition of science, or even a sufficient one. We've actually argued this point before. Such a demarcation plainly leads to absurdities. Any past or present hypothesis, no matter how fruitful or significant, can no longer be deemed scientific if it is no longer considered true, approximately true, or more likely to be true than its rivals, including Newton's theory of gravity, by the way. The thus false hypothesis, like Darwin's pangenesis view of heredity, and Copernicus's model of the solar system with its circular orbits are decidedly non-scientific. On this view, naturalistic origin of life research has fallen on hard times. At present, there is no consensus in the field, but only a number of hypotheses on offer. Insofar as these hypotheses are mutually exclusive, at most only one of them can be true. Does that mean the, less, the rest are literally unscientific? The empirical justification for methodological naturalism fails for two additional related reasons. First, recall that it draws on a historical pattern of naturalistic theory success. Second, it remains clear, unclear whether naturalistic or secondary theories actually do enjoy a relevant pattern of explanatory success in the history of science. Again, think junk DNA. The alleged historical pattern may not be as clear as one might think. Of course, a critic might counter that the scientific success of currently evolutionary theory, juxtaposed to the failure of contemporary creationism and ID, justifies barring the latter from biology. But wait. Methodological naturalism holds that supernaturalist theories cannot be considered within biology. Science is silent about them. Yet this justification of methodological naturalism depends on the scientific superiority of evolutionary theory over its theology laden opponents, I might add, when evaluated scientifically. It uses the very grounds it excludes. The empirical justification for methodological naturalism quietly draws upon the alleged scientific superiority of evolutionary theory over its supernatural rivals as the basis for declaring that these very rivals are not worthy of scientific scrutiny. Rivals cannot be tested and yet have failed all tests. This is incoherent. Skipping on, stepping back for a moment, there is much more to be said about methodological naturalism, both for and against. For now, in light of the apparent weaknesses of some of the best justifications <coughs> for methodological naturalism, coupled with the liabilities of methodological naturalism noted above, theistic evolutionists may wish to consider a more open approach to science. No doubt some theistic evolutionists will demur, however. They will choose to maintain, retain methodological naturalism. In one sense, I welcome their persistence. If they preserve the convention, then they ought to systematically repudiate all theology-laden arguments for evolutionary theory and also abandon all scientific 
engagement with creationism and ID. Once they've done so, they should articulate whatever grounds remain for evolutionary theory. My suspicion is that their case will be thin indeed. Part five, final thoughts. Regardless of whether methodological naturalism is intellectually justifiable, the convention itself remains enormous rhetorical power. It allows theistic evolutionists to designate their favorite theories as scientific while deeming theological rivals as non-scientific. Doing so both boosts the perceived intellectual credibility of evolutionary theory. And I would agree with that. This dynamic is nothing new. Aristotle arguing with the Hippocratic physicians way back when. Galileo, Cartesian national philosophers, Darwin, Nernst. The melee continues. Philosophic, philosopher Larry Loudon aptly characterizes this pattern. No one can look at the history of debates between scientists and pseudoscientists without realizing that demarcation criteria are typically used as machines de guerre, machines of war, in a polemical battle between rival camps. Methodological naturalism, like all such maneuvers, often relies on the prestige of science as a substitute for careful analysis of competing theories. It exchanges real engagement for the veneer of respectability. And that is a key paragraph, in, or piece of a paragraph. In the end, theistic evolutionists must make their choice. The case for evolutionary theory time and again involves theological claims or comparisons with theology-laden rivals in direct violation of methodological naturalism. If theistic evolutionists wish to retain a maximally strong case for evolution, if they wish to keep their battleship, they should reject methodological naturalism. It matters little whether natural or supernatural theories have titles like scientific or non-scientific. What matters is the empirical and conceptual credentials of each theory. What matters is which one best explains biological complexity and the rest of nature, I would add, too. What matters, in short, is which one is true. Now, my take on this, I think Dilly treats the debate about methodological naturalism as though it were honest. If one excluded all God talk from science, negative as well as positive, then Dilly's argument would be valid. But that is not the way methodological naturalism is used in science. As he note, Charles Darwin had it both ways. What's really going on is that the call for methodological naturalism is a call for unconditional surrender. We can use science to disprove God, but you can't use science to prove him. You may not like a godless world, but you are not allowed to raise any objections. So just shut up and allow us to control the public square. That's what really is happening. The whole argument is that science requires methodological naturalism. Science is the only way of obtaining truth, or at least the most important way. There, therefore, there can be no evidence for God. And if you think otherwise, it just shows you're a bigot, and probably a homophobe, sexist, and racist, and don't belong in civilized society. So whatever you do, don't say anything. There are two ways of working around this argument. One is to insist that there is truth outside of science, which is definitely true, and allow science to keep methodological naturalism, but just challenging its scope. And so if it can't, if it can't deal with theology, well, then theology has a wider scope. And maybe theology can make predictions that can be scientifically uh, validated. Or two, insist that if science can give evidence against God, it can also give evidence for God, in which case methodological naturalism, at least the ideal, not the pragmatic style that says, well, most of the time God doesn't do this, uh, is uh, true. The, the chapter at first struck me as concern trolling, kind of like when Democrats write articles detailing what Republicans should do to win or vice versa. You know, they're really doing things wrong. Yeah, well, you're kind of happy they're doing things wrong. Why don't you be quiet, you know? But on second thought, I think it is really a call for fairness. You either exclude it or you don't exclude it. You don't exclude part and then not exclude the whole thing. Either you don't use God talk at all, 
or use it and don't be surprised when you get opposing God talk back. However, frankly, I expect that call to fall on deaf ears. But that's my opinion. Now it's your turn. I'm, I'm impressed with the uh, details and the arguments he presented, which you know are quite logical. Um, I keep wondering, in the broader context, uh, what is the difference between methodological naturalism and atheism? Uh, the uh, it permits you to avoid uh, the stigma of atheism, which uh, sociolo sociologically, I think, atheism has a, it carries a, a load that people aren't always com comfortable with. Uh, <clears throat> so, no, no, I, I believe in methodological naturalism. Uh, in practice, I'm failing to see any difference between methodological naturalism and atheism. And so uh, is this just a convenient terminology to uh, say, hey, I'm not an atheist, folks, uh, but I'm sure not going to allow God in the picture, uh, which is a... a an oxymoron, I mean, a, a contradictory statement, actually. Uh, so I, uh, uh, my respect for methodological naturalism uh, uh, keeps going down. Come in over here. Go ahead, Jack. I'm very interested in listening to uh, your early part where you uh, quoted Francis Collins and, or the book did and uh, I having read that some time ago his evaluation I was completely blown away that it, one of the in some ways one of the most productive scientists in our current scene uh, makes such foolish comparisons uh, because the main reason why the eye is suboptimally designed is that the sensory cells, as you know, are behind a covering. Uh, this would not be a critique if it weren't for the cephalopod mollusks, mm -hmm. which is the only group which has the reverse design where the receptor cells are the first layer. Mm -hmm. uh, however, being the first layer severely limits the ability to control the way the eye functions in different environments. Now, this is mostly cephalopods live deep enough in the ocean that uh, the adaptability of the eye to different amounts of light is less important. And when you look at, at how the cells surrounding the rods and cones in the vertebrae are involved with nurturing it, controlling it, protecting it, increasing or decreasing its sensitivity, uh, I mean, if you want to use Collins's approach, you're going to have to say this gives more, much more adaptability than the cephalopod eye, which is a, a dead end in, in their evolutionary theory. It, it goes nowhere. Mm-hmm. You can only get so good, and then you no. have to quit. And uh, to me, this generalizes that Collins, like in my mind, as I said last week, Collins and uh, proponents on both sides of this simply set up straw men so they can critique the other approach. Did you uh, notice that he set up a theological straw man, too? Yes, actually. Because he knows what God should do, which he doesn't. 
And, of course, yeah. that's the way you get to straw men. Uh, it, it still... <laughs> Yeah. To be there fair, time, there there are times I felt guilty listening in this discussion for considering myself as a methodological naturalist <laughs> because I I'm I'm an experimental scientist. I can only look at the experiment and the results and evaluate them. If I then say that the probability is very high that this is the effect of uh, some would say, you know, well, then you must mean this or that or the other. We can easily step away from methodological naturalism before we go to a primary cause. And that's what, when I say we have done in our Andrews program, that was the way we approached it. Uh, when you start saying this mechanism is too complex for evolution to explain, there, there, there must have been a designer... Uh, you're no longer in anything other than opinion and evaluation that can't be validated. I can readily say that, but I, I would, I say I'm no, I'm not using science to make that statement because there's no way to use the tools of science to evaluate it. So it seemed like in this whole discussion, and and I've been enlightened and and very surprised uh, that. Both sides set up a definition of methodological naturalism that allows them to critique the other side. And so, in a sense, uh, I'm not in any way suggesting that the time about this uh, was, was not as well spent as it might have been, because I learned a lot what others mean by methodological mm -hmm. naturalism. Mm -hmm. And I will think, be more careful in, in owning it. Uh, to people who may not understand what I'm saying, I'm owning. To me, that's the take-home message. Yeah. Well, to me, that whole section is really trying to win by definition. Precisely. And you set up the definition in such a way that your probability of win winning is very high, but very un, un but not analyzable. Yeah. And. And to me, what it does is it, uh, I mean, it, you know, your thing is not scientific, therefore it's not reliable. Well, you know, <laughs> that's arguing about the definition of science. Uh, what do we mean by optimality? Do we mean by optimality using unlimited resources? You know, should, should claws be made out of diamond because it's the hardest substance known? <laughs> Good point. I just was blown away with Colin's approach at, the, at this point, when I read his his book, uh, it said, "Wow, I didn't expect that from him." Mm -hmm. I kind of did because I uh, because I've seen that kind of approach well, far too often. With your background, uh, you would have seen it much more, much sooner than I did. I was very peaceful with my evaluation of being a methodological naturalist yeah. because I don't go outside of what I can. Uh -huh do in the lab yeah. or use, use clearly objective tools to evaluate. And if I step outside it, I don't claim to be using science. I'm using philosophy, yeah. logic maybe, but not science. Well, I mean, my approach to methodological naturalism is quite frankly kind of a uh, an experimental, or I've forgotten what he called it now, but uh, it's... Most of the time, we don't have God interfering with the lab. Some of the time, we do. But it's rare. If it wasn't rare, we couldn't do lab science at all. And the interesting thing is that where it looks like God may have interfered with the lab, he actually helped things along. Um, uh, Mendel's experiments came out a little too cleanly, and people have gone back and done the math and shown that uh, that uh, that uh, his one quarter three quarters divisions were um, statistically unlikely but it's entirely possible that God wanted that point to get through mm -hmm. and made it clear enough to where Mendel would figure it out so in my book if God's going to get into the lab he actually 
he actually make things better. <laughs> anyway. And you're ready to evaluate that. What? You're ready to evaluate that statement within science. Um, well, I can Pardon say me. Mendel's just, experiments are, just usually, being are usually considered science. You know? Your last three uh, words. My, in my opinion, the walls between science and non-science are porous. That science grades into non-science and that there are connections that go between <clears throat> and that theology is not excluded from science even though uh, some people try to do so. And I think that scientific theories that say there should be, let's say, soft parts in dinosaurs or there should be carbon-14 in dinosaurs are kind of science, not kind of science. There are places where, you know, they're testable. So in that sense, they're scientific. On the other hand, they're definitely not naturalistic. And in that sense, by some people's definition, they're not scientific. just want to point out... Uh we're dealing with one of the greatest redefinitions that has occurred in history, and that is the definition of science. Uh, science was done, you know, in the in the theistic context. And, uh, our pioneers all believed in God and uh, referred to God in their scientific writings. I'm speaking of guys like Boyle and I, Pascal and Newton and uh, Galileo and so on. Uh, th these folks uh, included God in the science, and uh, uh, that was part of it. Now, of course, the word science is rather recent in a way. We were called natural philosophers then, but then anyway, they were doing the same thing. Uh, now, uh, science almost implies atheism. Uh, and uh, God was rejected out of science in the 19th century. And then it, uh, 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 Chambers started it. Darwin, I kind of added a cap to it. And uh, pretty soon he, 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 he's not tolerated in this anymore. We, we, we uh, don't allow this because it's, it's not science, whatever science you can define science as. Well, the interesting thing is that Darwin himself is not scientific by that definition because he did allow that God might have created one form or a few and then allowed it to evolve from there. Well, Whereas a, a really pure scientific approach using that particular definition of science says that, uh, uh, that the origin of life has to be completely beyond uh, any interference with any putative God. But if you're going to stick to pure materialistic thing, science violates that all the time. Uh, they go way beyond what they see uh, and so on. Just don't bring God in the picture here. And the funny part of it is, for the physicist, he's making his reappearance. And there are a lot of people who really don't like that but they don't really have good arguments against it. You're talking about the precision of the forces? And the I'm fun. talking about the precision that would be required for a Big Bang to make things work. Yeah. The realization that the, yeah. that the original creation had to have incredibly low entropy. Uh, yeah. I mean, you can, mm -hmm. you can go down the list of all the things that are there and... Uh, uh, in fact, for quantum mechanics itself, yeah. Some things that, happen. Things happen reproducibly. Things happen to thirteen decimal places. Mm -hmm. I mean, we're talking extremely accurate predictions, yeah. and yet with no mm -hmm. no atomistic mechanism to account for it. Big Bang is sometimes described as the ultimate free lunch. Yeah, yeah. It's incredible. It's incredible how precise things have to be for that thing to yeah. work. And the origin of life. 
and the fact that our planet is the way it is, not too far away, not too close, um, uh, with the moon to you know keep the ocean stirred up a bit, um, uh, and to keep the Earth's rotation in a reasonably uh, narrow range. Uh, I mean, the kinds of things that are required. Uh, you know, the the latest, I guess, the uh, latest theory was that some object collided with the Earth about, I don't know, four billion years ago or something like that, and the pieces congealed out to form the moon, leaving aside the question of whether uh, the moon, uh, as you go backwards in time, spirals into the Earth a lot faster than that. Um, there's the problem of the... Uh, uh, you know the chance of having that happen um, with just the right amount of force to congeal just the right amount of matter outside the moon and to have it to where now when we're living here the moon just nicely covers up the sun the uh, precision of the four basic forces of physics is uh, incredibly essential for items to exist. Uh, I suggest if these forces had varied by l more than one part out of a thousand, uh, we would not have nature as we have it, complete mm -hmm. atoms and mm -hmm. so on. Uh, and yet uh, those forces uh, have they vary from very weak ones like gravity to a strong nuclear force that uh, every one of them exactly where it has to be in order for us to have matter matter as we have it and both it's fortunate we have matter uh, it's probably probably important yeah and the fact that we uh, the fact that we have carbon is uh, as plentiful as it is and other weird things that are not usually talked about like how come the Earth has so much more non-hydrogen stuff than the Sun does? It would be interesting to figure out the percentage of, of non-hydrogen in the Sun and, 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 what, uh, and uh, the percentage of non-hydrogen stuff in the various planets and, and ask questions about whether, whether that makes sense out of a, a, a proto-solar system that's congealing from from uh, a gas cloud. Uh, I mean, nobody talks about those things, and the reason why is, of course, because they are concerned about the answers might be misunderstood. And Supposedly, like 200 fine-tuned factors. Just a minute. Supposedly, the, it's up to about 200 fine-tuned factors now. Yeah. Now, to be fair, some of them are probably interrelated with each other, but still, even if let's say only a hundred of them survive independently, it's still a huge coincidence. And you know, at a certain point, you begin to wonder whether that coincidence is real. In fact, the interesting thing of it is that people like Collins, Francis Collins, and uh, others in that group who will argue against the evidence for God in evolution will argue for the evidence from God in terms of the creation of the universe. Now you can read uh, the, the language of God, it's, it's right in there. And I was struck by the fact that really Collins is a, if I can put it that way, a secret... Um, um, uh, a secret intelligent design advocate and doesn't realize it. That, that, that as far as when the universe is being created, he's quite willing to say that God designed it. It's just when evolution comes along that he's not willing to say that. Yes? Along the lines of this discussion, I find it very interesting that the evidence for design in the universe and in our solar system is so overwhelming that to my limited mind the most ridiculous 
approach to explaining that without uh, divine planning is the multiverse. You have so many n new universes happening, many a second, that sooner or later, if you make enough, you're going to randomly get all these things together. And we just have to be in the lucky universe. And, and of course, that's a well, scientific statement because well, we have evidence for these multiverses happening, right? My response to As that. As I understand it, is the universe, by definition, is self-contained. That that there is no way of peering beyond it because if you if you can peer beyond it, it's really part of our universe after all. Oh, you're which discovering new. If, which you're, means that if you're going to do the multiverse, uh, basically there can be not just there is, but there can be no scientific evidence for it. <laughs> yeah. Well, to me, the multiverse thing is easy because if everything is possible, then you could have a, a, a universe with a, a creator God in it. So, settles that. Of course. <laughs> of course. Excellent point. <clears throat> Was it an uh, atheist that discovered DNA? Well, a couple of atheists. Uh, and actually, to be fair, they did it on the back of a couple more. See, Some I, of whom didn't get credit, but we'll leave I that love up. it when atheists do great science. Because when it's when science is done right, and you find stuff like DNA, you end up finding things that actually um, make their own premise very hard to stick with, and it starts pointing outside of itself. Yeah, well, I think one of the theories that that really support that is used to support methodological naturalism is. Material is all there is anyway. And so science is the best way to study material. And so if you're looking at material, then there can't be anything outside of it, period. And so methodological naturalism is just making that assumption and running with it. And there's the two kinds. There's the hard kind and the soft kind. The soft kind says we'll keep running as far as we can. That part I can agree with. The hard kind is, and we'll keep running even if it becomes obvious that we can't. That we will just say, well, sooner or later it'll come around our way. And so we'll stick inside of this box because we know it's the only box possible. And that really is philosophical naturalism posing as methodological naturalism. And that's one of the reasons why, if they really mean methodological naturalism that can be challenged, I'm with them. If they really mean philosophical naturalism, they lost me. The point you just made, uh, in uh, Climbing Mount Improbable, Richard Dawkins says in a simple paragraph, the original development of life could not have involved DNA. Because for DNA to function effectively, you have a, a suite of 70 or 80 proteins that have to pre-exist. And so he then says, well, that can't have been the origin of life. And then he creates a totally hypothetical, unsupported, uh, and forgive me, I don't want to be... Uh, I don't feel this way really, but one of the strengths of the way he proposes is that it was originally based on another Britisher's research. If you read him carefully, he's very biased towards the kinds of intellectual thought that have come out of, uh, of Great Britain and, and that sort of thing. And so, but he's, he is absolutely immune from bias. Well, he has to leave naturalism pretty quickly in order to to start thinking beyond the material and the DNA. And interestingly, interestingly enough, that DNA itself is it really is it really material? I mean, what what does it represent? What's its function? And once you once you start going down that road, then you get into information. And once you get into information, then you start getting into deep waters pretty quickly and you and you are forced to begin 
looking outside of purely what we can see in the natural world to explain where the information came from. So, um, so like a little different tack, but this idea of the Big Bang, I'm, I'm still not clear why, why are creationists against the concept of a Big Bang? I mean, it seems a natural, perfect explanation, if you will, of God creating something out of nothing. Well, that depends. Um, it, uh, so what would if, be if you're talking about if you uh, what I, what I've given is a large category of short life creationism, there are people who believe in young life, but an old Earth and an old universe. In which case, the Big Bang is quite uh, All right, so congenial the, the main to their to reason. Their, would be because of then, it happening 14 billion years ago. Yeah, then uh, and the Earth happened 4.5 or 4.6 or whatever it is a billion years ago, and. Um, and then there are people who um, who believe in a young Earth, young solar system, right. but old universe, in which case 13.7 billion years, why not? Um, and, you know, the Earth would still be very, very dark when it was created, so the because only all you have is starlight. So the only issue would be when it happened. Yeah, the only issue As would be explained. when it happened. Um, there the concept, are those who believe that it was created within, you know, at the time of creation, and specifically on the fourth day, the entire universe. Right. Um, and that is kind of an easy way to read the text. It all depends on one verse, actually two Hebrew words. Be'et hakokambim, or to be, uh, as we would translate it, either and the stars or with the stars, depending on how you translate that. Whether be'et is um, is an objective, uh, is an object marker in Hebrew, or whether it's the preposition that means with. Um, and there's a whole discussion of that, but uh, I'm not so going to bring that in here. Light, night and day, being created before the sun. That's not a problem. Remember, at the end of creation, uh, pardon me, at the end of the new creation, there will be no need of the sun. Whether there'll be a sun there anyway, I don't know. Maybe just to mark time or something, but uh, but God Himself is the light at that point. So, uh, to put it uh, in American film uh, parlance, uh, parlance, God don't need no stinking sun. <laughs> um, well, all right. And, and there are those who feel that it was written that way precisely to make that point. Uh, on the other hand, um, you know, one can argue that the, that, uh, the, the sun itself uh, was, create, uh, was created before and that what really happened was the light from the sun reached the earth. Um, being blocked off by either uh, dense clouds above or or uh, uh, or by uh, you know something in the way between the sun and the earth and the reason I point that out is because if you read the text very carefully it doesn't say the sun it says the greater light and then the lesser light to rule the night and so that, uh, that means that the bodies themselves could have been there before and God simply allowed them to give light to the earth. So there are a number of different ways to deal with that. Uh, I guess one of my points is that if you can find ways to distinguish between those kinds of hypotheses scientifically, 
I'm all for testing them. On the other hand, if you can't find ways of distinguishing those hypotheses, I think that we should kind of just not make too much of of the differences at that point. And what we really should do is look for differences in hypotheses uh, for the age of life on Earth, which is something that all varieties of young age creationists agree on. And those are things that are can be very fruitful. Um, you know, looking at layers that look like they were laid down right one on top of the other, and yet there are 20 million years or 50 million years, or in one case, 100 million years difference. Um, I guess there's some that are 200 years, aren't there? 200 million years that are missing with layers that look like they were laid right down on top of each other. Paraconformities. 150 is about the biggest there is. Yeah. So, you know, you can have uh, you can have uh, several hundred million years anyway, uh, where they just like say it's gone. Um, I, I think that those are creationist hypotheses that are worth looking at. Uh, the same way with soft sediment deformation. The same way with carbon fourteen in very old material, the same way with dinosaur bones that are shown to still preserve proteins. And in fact, although it's vigorously disputed because the implications are just too huge, there's actually some evidence of DNA being, uh, uh, being preserved. And there's some evidence of DNA that we can sequence coming from the Eocene, which is fascinating. Uh, and in, and uh, it's particularly fascinating when you realize that the standard model requires these things to have been going, uh, living at, uh, sitting around at room temperature for 40 million years or 35 million years or something like that first, and then having gotten into the Ice Age and then having things frozen, whereas the standard creationist theory would have them being at the most killed in the flood and then buried and then frozen later uh, and probably in a matter of years later and still frozen and so we can find DNA in them and that, to me that's just uh, you know if if we find that kind of stuff it'll be really tough well I shouldn't say if we find it because it looks like we are finding it if we have found it. Uh, DNA from not so much dinosaurs as plants, but frozen in permafrost. And it's just, it, it's, it's fascinating. Um, and of course, you know, it's getting that material published is, uh, shall we say, interesting. Anyway, Come back next week and we'll delve into uh, the practical implications of taking theistic evolution seriously.